Welcome everyone to Revisto's Percolating Collaboration Podcast. Today we have Sal D'Ambrosia, Director of Construction Technology from WM Blanchard. Welcome, Sal. What a week we've just had coming back from Rev Up 24 in Denver, Colorado, um, where you were the keynote presenter um, and you just blew my mind. Um, your experience, um, your passion resonated with me deeply. So, Sal, tell me a wee bit more about yourself, why you're in construction and why you're so passionate about um, digital technology. For those that had missed your keynote, um, I'm sure there's a lot on our audience um, that are, you know, just brimming to hear from you. Well, first, I appreciate that. And I appreciate Revisto having me and giving me the opportunity to speak. And uh, my background started very young. Something that I think is lost on the youth of today is, you know, at 14 years old, I wanted to be a plumber. And that was my goal. And I don't think we see that a lot in youth today. You know, they all want to be doctors, lawyers, and things like that. But um, I wanted to be a plumber, and that was the path I took. And I stayed with, with that plumbing and installing that piping in the field until from 1984 till about uh, 2000 and. Uh, when I started to get into the uh, digital thing and uh, or digital age, and I sort of stumbled on that, you know, just uh, the organization I was working for needing some help with getting some trade input into the model. And, um, and I realized pretty quick that, you know, you could teach somebody how to use the computer in a few weeks, but to teach somebody 20 years of plumbing experience, it would take 20 years. So, uh, I ran with that and and basically taught the you know the, the computer to myself while I was doing it and uh, and realized that that was the way to go and sort of pushed for that you know and have been pushing for that you know since that time to get the right people in the seats you know uh, I mean I think you caught it from my keynote that we because the technology is technology and it is a little bit different or a little bit difficult especially for those that are a little less tech savvy, they're intimidated by it, you know? So you don't see the people in the field looking to jump into that seat to do that because a lot of them, including myself, just thought it was impossible. You know, I thought that anyone that was going to use the computer in that way and to be deep, be able to detail pipe had to be above my intellect. And, uh, and that wasn't, that wasn't the case at all. And um, so I think we've pushed a lot of the field people away from it. And, you know, when with the goal with trying to build a puzzle or a digital twin, not to use those catch words, but, you know, to try and get stuff to be modeled and fabricatable and get it out there to the field. It just seems like common sense that the more educated, more knowledgeable, more experienced person would be putting the effort into getting that model created and then give it to someone in the field who is basically turned into an installer because they're putting together a piece of a puzzle and that person to be less experienced. And what we see far too often are, you know, young men and women with no experience one week out of college that that took a, a, a Revit course, you know, and knows how to use Revit and they start copying design drawings and give that to the people in the field with all of that vast experience and tell them to just build it. But in reality, it's not any better than the design that they, that are, they had originally gotten, you know, before the coordinated drawings. Yes, it might be more coordinated, but there's a far difference and a vast difference be something, between something that's coordinated and constructible. Yes. You know, anyone could take the piping and run it below the ceiling and it's never going to hit ductwork, but you can't install it there. And I'm not saying it's that bad, but there are things, you know, that, that we see that are, you know, and I mean, I, I, I have a I have a project right now where the, the entire sanitary system is vented on the wrong floor. You know, oh, wow. that's that's you know, that that is something that any plumber picks out as soon as they start doing the detailing. Someone that's not a plumber is just going to follow that design and go with it. So that was that's pretty much it in a nutshell is to get those people more involved. and. um you know, I think Revisto is, and I mentioned that in my keynote, is it, it's the gateway for these people, right? The yeah. the the mechanics, the journeymen, the foremen that are out there in the field that are intimidated by construction technology. Revisto gives them that gateway to into that technology because it's a game. 
You know, I call it collaboration, call of duty. Yeah, and it's a video that. game. And and I think that, you know, there are plenty of, you know, 40-year-old men and women that, you know, you might say are a little less tech savvy that are out there playing video games and they have their, you know, it's funny, you find the same people that say, oh, you know, Sal, I, I, it's the computer, I'm not very good at that. And then you, you're in talking to them, you figure out that their entire home is a smart home. It's all wired and, and everything is Wi-Fi in the whole house. It's smart. And they did it. Yeah. But yet, but yet when you ask, when you put a model in front of them, which is literally press the left button and move forward, they're, they're, I can't do that. You know, yeah. and then a lot of it is just not being able to try. We're not trying and not having the ambition. And then there's a couple of things that um, really resonate with me with what, what you've just mentioned, but also in your keynote. And it's uh, something that takes me back to my own childhood. My, my father was a builder um, and my awesome grandfathers enough. were builders. So I grew up on construction sites. And with that, um, there was a message that my father always said to me, you know, he wished he could put old heads on young shoulders. Um, and that's, that's what you're saying. Um, I, I just really like this idea. And I wonder, you know, what can we do as industry partners um, to inspire um, the next generation? And I think you're absolutely right. Um, we need to get the experienced people behind creating these digital prototypes because they know how to build. Um, right. And then because their shoulders are old um, and, and no disrespect to the experienced people in our construction industry, but maybe they move from site to the site hut um, and the young people move from the site hut to the site um, who are more fit and able. I'm keen to hear your thoughts on how we can try and turn it around. Yeah, well, the, you know, one of the things I mentioned in the keynote is, uh, and I and I, I found out later on that Revisto is actually um, doing some of this, but you know, to get the platform in the hands of every trade union that there is, every trade school that there is, and there aren't enough of them, every college that may have a construction course. You know, it's odd when you talk to someone, and I've talked to many coming out of college that are on a mechanical path or mechanical engineering, and you know, they have done some designing or detailing and stuff. It seems like their detailing is always, I made this sprocket or I made this, you know, gear. And that's great. That has nothing to do with what we're doing. You're never going to draw a socket. Can you draw a heating hot water pipe? And can you draw a steam pipe? And that is not something that they're getting. So to get it in their hands so that they could see actual construction, you know, um, I've gone to a few uh, trade show or, or career days or career fairs for local colleges. And um, you could see the young men and women just walk right by when they see overalls, hard hats, and safety vests. But if you're flying Revisto on the screen, they don't walk by anymore. They're interested because they see a construction video game that they might want to play. Yeah. So, yes, it's not a construction video game day in and day out. It's a lot harder duty. than that. But that is their gateway into yeah. doing that. And I think, like, if you were to have Revisto in the hands of a bunch of wanted anything to do with construction technology uh they may they may see this and say oh you know what maybe i'll take this to the next step maybe i can be the person that drafts this and if nothing else jason it's to get their input at least right if it now if you're detailing the project and you have former field foreman and former general foreman and and they're doing the detailing then yes it may be an added task to have another general foreman, field foreman review it. Lord knows when I was in the field, if I did my layout in the field, the last thing I wanted was another foreman coming in to critique it. So you might not want that. But what I'm saying is if you are putting the time and the effort into doing the detailing with somebody that does, that is inexperienced, because let's face it, we're talking about busying, building a puzzle and we're talking about prefabrication, modulization, and all of those things. Why would you ever have someone that you would never choose to be your field foreman to be what, in essence, is everything that your field foreman will install? That is just mind boggling to me. And it would never happen in the field. You would never see a 24 year old young man or woman right out of college walk into the field and somebody put a hard hat on their head and say, You're the foreman, go lay out the work. But for yeah. some reason, sit them in a seat. And you say, lay out all the work. 
and we'll put it in a total station. We'll cut the pieces up and we'll send it to somebody in the field who has been installing it for 20 years. That's backwards. That, yes. that's, that, that, that's just backwards. So um, getting those people more involved and maybe it's not even on the detailing, but to say, listen, and that's the perfect place for Revisto because it's live, because it's active, is to have that field foreman uh, reviewing that model. If the person that is detailing must be less experienced, at least they're getting the experience. Because don't get me wrong, I don't want anyone that, that's listening to this think that, oh, well, Sal thinks that you can't ever be a good detailer unless you put boots on and worked in the field. That is not the case. I've seen many detailers that never put boots on, never had a hard hat on her, and they're good, but it takes time. Experience is experience, and you can't fast forward experience. So yes, if you've been detailing plumbing for 20 years, and you've had people that are mentoring you along the way, the same way I did in the field, usually they were mentoring me by throwing a cup of coffee at my head because it wasn't sweet enough. But if you were getting any of that training, then yes, in 20 years, you could be a good detailing or detailer plumber pipe fitter sheet metal sheet metal worker or whatever that is but that takes time so those aren't the people i'm complaining about what i'm complaining about are the organizations that want to do prefabrication or maybe they don't or want to get through that bim process because it's a spec a, a line in their spec sheet or their job scope and that's all they want to do first of all those people should never be doing it because every nickel that you're spending on it, you're throwing out the window, because unless you're using that model and the data from that model in the field, you're only getting about 20% of the effort that you put into it. So when those contractors say, oh, well, BIM is expensive, of course it's expensive. If you buy a Ferrari and don't put gas in it, you wasted your money. Yeah, I if love you, that. <laughs> if you complete a BIM model, right, and put 100000 or $200,000 into modeling that, and then send a piece of paper out to the field, and tell your field team to grab their tape measures, plumb bobs, and chalk lines, and start measuring it, you wasted probably 180000 of that $200,000, right? So you want to get that right person involved with doing that. You want to get that data out there into the field. I mean, let's face it. The perfect project is we break the, break the, the entire project up into assemblies, the small packages that are delivered same day to the field. The hangers are already laid out. The, the basket is wheeled or the pile is wheeled directly to the location and you put pipe number 67 and hanger number 38. That does not take a 20 year licensed plumber, pipe fitter, sheet metal worker to do. You're putting a number in a number where the real knowledge comes in is the person that created that. And, the, and again, I don't want to repeat myself, but the person that we see creating that stuff does not have the knowledge to to be capable of doing that. Yeah, and a hundred percent, that's absolutely resonating with me. There's um, a couple more things I'd like to tease out. Talking about the next generation and how they get excited when they see the the gamification of construction. Um, and what have you seen, um, or what are you doing in in the space to you know encourage the next generation in your company um, and with the trade schools that you mentioned? Yeah, so with with Blanchard, uh, with W and Blanchard, what they what they've done is when they when they noticed we have a uh, you know we are an old school contractor, right? Been in business before uh, Abraham Lincoln's presidency. Wow, so, uh, they, this is mind blowing. Time. Yeah, it is crazy. It's 165 years or something like that that we've been building buildings. Uh, it's an older organization. You wouldn't think that they would have forward-thinking leadership, but they do, and they see the value in this. And we are 99% healthcare, and, and, and virtual design is big in healthcare. It's probably more big than even our owners realize it is and how much how helpful it is uh, for, what, for what we do. So when they saw that value in that, they, they tasked me with, teaching basically the entire organization over the last two years how to utilize Revisto in their space, you know, and uh, project managers use it far different than BIM coordinators and superintendents use it different than project managers and so on. So we're teaching them to use it in that aspect. Um, where else I'm doing is with, with my subcontractors, who a lot of them are, you know, um, union plumber, pipe fitters, uh, you know, field, field uh, men and women. Uh, 
I'm pushing them to utilize it at more than they would have, would utilize it. And in, in ways that, you know, um, we provide stamps that are for trade use only. And the stamp is intended for the foreman in the field to speak to the detailer from his organization without me even being included to private stamp between the two of them so that when there is an issue in the field, we don't get that, you know, typical field fix that never return, returns in the model. It has to be fixed in the model before it is fixed in the field. And when the people in the field start to see that collaboration and how that could work and how they could get a model back quick by pressing a sync button and seeing the pipe is now actually in the spot or ductwork is in the spot that they wanted to, uh, that's a big, that's very helpful for them. Another thing that is very helpful is, and again, you have a lot of, you know, veteran field members that are afraid of technology. Maybe it's ego, maybe it's fear, maybe it's think, think they can't do it, whatever it is. Once they get inside of there and they realize that they can ask that model questions that they can't ever ask the paper. It is, and I, and I basically started off my keynote with that, right? I mean, you, you, yeah. you, you have that piece of paper and you have questions on that piece of paper. I mean, let's face it, on a piece of paper, you leave out one pipe size annotation and I know, and I no longer have any idea if it's two inch pipe, two and a half inch pipe, three inch pipe, or so on, right? I can't ask the piece of paper that, but I can ask the model that. If I, if you fail to give me an elevation on a piece of pipe or a piece of ductwork, I can go in the model and I can get that information. I can't ask the paper that. Once they start to realize that, wow, I don't need him anymore. I'm not, I don't have to rely on him to give me the answers. I could do this on my own, then it, they, you could really see it start to take, you know, oh, wow, I want to do this more. I want to get a hold of this more. I don't want to have to ask him, you know, I want to be able to get get the answer uh, and, and do that. So that's another place that it's helpful. I don't see anything in the way of trade schools or trade unions. I mean, I know the trade unions around here, they, they do uh, some like, Revit training, you know, and and or maybe even AutoCAD still some of that, and and that's great. Uh, you're teaching somebody how to be a designer. I think you're probably running before you walk and walking before you crawl. Uh, that's why I think Revisto is that gateway. I think you need to get that in their hands first, so that they learn how to use the tool that can actually build, not the tool that builds. Right. So you're yeah. considering Revit as the tool that builds. But Revisto is the tool, is the tool, Revit is the tool that builds things, but but you use Revisto to build things, okay? It's yes. the tool, it's the puzzle, it's what you read. That's very easy to use. It's not as difficult as it is to start detailing in Revit. That's not to say that that's very, deta very detailed either. They can learn how to do that. They all can. But getting them to understand what 3D looks like, why we do it, and to grow that passion as to, oh, well, you know, I would I would be the first one if I, I was lucky enough to come into this accidentally in like 2004. If I wasn't in there now and this was, let's say, even if it was like 2010 and people started handing me a model, my mind would go absolutely crazy because I could not install something that somebody else was just telling me to install. So I don't blame those people at all. What I do blame them on is if you have that personality, if you're that passionate about the way you design things and where you put them and the way you want them, you're in the wrong place now. In 2024, you need to be sitting in this seat, not there, because we can't stop building the jobs the way we know that are they can be built because you don't want to do it. If you don't want to do that, then join this side yes. and get in the seat. And you give it to those people if you're that good at it. But if you're that good at it and somebody is handing you a model that they've already put that time and effort into, you have to follow. Now, if the people that have built that model are not talented enough, we have an issue. That circles back to what I've been saying for the last 20 minutes. Unfortunately, that is a problem. But that's how we fix it. Yes. You just keep installing it. Absolutely. And, you know, there's something that, um, you know, also resonates with me is, is you mentioned a couple of times that you accidentally found yourself in this position. 
How did you find yourself in this position? What what was the big accident that found you where you are today? Yeah, so we I, I I had to go where I was I was asked to go and sit next to our detailer who had been detailing in 3D, um, but we were still getting everything wrong. And the project that we had, it had we didn't have time to you know re-coordinate it when it got in the field, which seems to happen far too often. And I went there and sat next to him and Jason, I was only there for a couple of minutes, and I saw this little button up on top of his AutoCAD screen that said BOM, and I was like, that's got to mean bill of material, yeah, right? I mean, what else could it possibly mean? It's construction software. So I asked him to press the button, and he was unsure why I would even want to press that button. And when he pressed it, sure enough, I got a bill of material for everything that was on the model, which made my mind explode because, you know, traditionally I would be sitting in a trailer, a cold trailer for probably two weeks, trying to hand highlight and count all of those fittings. And this magician had a magic button that gave me the answer in three seconds, you know? And when I saw that, I was like, I got to know more about this. And then where the accident came into play was, the gentleman that I was sitting next to was a volunteer firefighter, and he was apparently more passionate about his firefighting than he was his detailing, and there was a small fire in town, and he decided that uh, on only the third day I was there, that he, so three days in, actually two and a half days in, he decided that he was going to go fight a fire, and um, he never got back in his seat when he came That's back. That's so awesome. Um, <laughs> because, I, 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 and, you know, I, like I said, I sat there for probably five minutes with still that intimidated, I'm never gonna be able to do this. And it turned into, okay, he pressed this button and he pressed this button and then he drew pipe. And I pressed that button, pressed that button and it drew pipe. And I said, this is like a glorified game assignment sets. Press the red button, press the green button, press the red button, it draws pipe. Press the green button, press the yellow button, it, it ends the pipe, right? It was all, you know, like Simon says, and the knowledge was, why does that pipe go there? Why does that fitting turn that way? What, what, why do I use this fitting there and not that fitting there? That was the knowledge. So when he came back after fighting his fire, I fighting the fire, I just basically said, we're gonna go and do this a lot faster. If you continue to tell me what buttons I have to press and I know where the pipe is going already, rather than me trying to explain why we're piping things that way. Yes. And I probably lasted in that position another day just another day before I took his computer off his desk and I took it to the job site and detailed the rest of the job from the job site. And once you do that, and I and I only wish that there were more foremen that had this opportunity, because once you sit right there, detail a section of pipe and hand it to somebody and all the cut pieces that are associated with it and have it packaged and brought right to the area and see it put up as a foreman to understand how you're getting no more questions, no more pushback. Yes. You're just putting yes. the stuff in. It was like, I was able to be a better foreman than I was when I was in the field sitting at a desk. Yes. So I instantly said, we need virtual general foreman, virtual foreman, and even more importantly, and something we did not touch on, because now I am in the general contractor role, right? That person that is running that, and this, 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 I'm sure when I say this, there's going to be a uh, there's going to be a hundred heads spinning around because you don't see this anywhere or hardly anywhere. That person that is running or managing that coordination or virtual design process, he is or she is your virtual superintendent. Absolutely. So why should they not have? the same knowledge or same skill set as that superintendent who let's let so let's 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 go over our goal here jason right our goal is to produce something that when it goes out in the field we no longer have any issues Correct. okay so now if that is our goal why is our most talented most experienced person still walking the floor to look at what would should be no problems Yes. When the person who is trying to figure out all of those problems before they get to the field is a person that's one week out of college and has never seen a piece of pipe, a wall built in their life. Yeah. You know what they are? They're somebody that presses that button. And Gravisto has an unbelievable clash automation. 
But until it has 30 years of construction experience in it, in, in AI form, it's never going to happen. So you could press that clash button. And yes, that piece of three quarter inch medical gas copper that doesn't have any conflicts that's running exposed below the ceiling can't be installed there. <laughs> yes. It's clash free, but yes. no one in their right mind is going to install it there in the field. So it's going to move somewhere. You've now destroyed the puzzle and not for the person that is installing that piece of med gas for the sheet for the sheet metal contractor who it's, you now you're hitting his duct work to now the sheet metal contractor is hitting the fire protection and the fire protection is probably dropped down and hitting the lights and needs to lower the ceiling because it always turns into something that bad. And I hear all the time, oh, Sal, you're always thinking of the worst because it always is the worst. <laughs> it never just hits one thing. It hits everything all the yeah. time. And it stems from one person not doing their job. So what we're what we have now, all right, in today, and this is again, New Jersey seems to be a little bit behind. We know that, right? But but what we have now is we have inexperienced detailers detailing stuff that is incorrect. It is being managed by a virtual superintendent who is not a virtual superintendent and doesn't understand that it's wrong. That's going out to the field where. Tell me if this doesn't sound like 1984, where we are like once again giving it to the person in the field to QA, QC it, manage it, make sure it's correct, and then we're giving it to the superintendent to monitor it and make sure that they have picked up all of those things that are correct. Nothing has changed out there. That has not changed if you do that. The only way it has changed is if you are delivering that puzzle out there to the field and it is constructible and the superintendent doesn't have anything that he needs to put a punch list on okay that is not where we're getting because the people that are doing that upfront work are not capable of doing that i'm mean, not saying it's everywhere maybe it maybe it's not i mean oh, actually i think why it resonates so strongly with me is your observations in north america is what i've observed in apac um, australia and new zealand you know something that um hits a, a note with me is this concept of measure twice cut once my dad was always Measure twice, cut once. Um, if I cut it wrong, um, I was in trouble. Um, so it, I, I think of BIM and um, BDC as the measure twice component, and you need that experience so you know um, how the project goes together. So you're prototyping what you're about to build um, so you can build it with efficiency. And I, I'm really keen to understand the kind of efficiency that you're seeing when you get that optimum workflow that you've been talking about and you flip the experience um, around. What kind of efficiencies are you seeing in WM Blanchard? So, I mean, our efficiency, just adding, you know, uh, we've we've added the total station about, you know, four years ago when I came on and, and everybody saw, obviously, the efficiency and the accuracy with that, with our with our uh, project managers and our project executives and, and, um, and our superintendents now joining in the Revisto thing, uh, the ability to get questions answered faster you know um the gone are the days of take a screenshot put it in an email the screenshot to you meant perfect sense but that a person that doesn't know what you were thinking about when you sent it it makes no sense at all so then that person spends the next 20 minutes trying to fly around the model and see what you were you were talking about revisto brings you right to that spot locks you in that spot so you know what that person is doing. It has the chat. So if you still don't understand it, the person can actually smack you in the back of the head and say, this is what I'm talking about. You know, so um, it gives you that ability. virtual smack in the back of the head. I yeah, love the it. virtual <laughs> smack in the back of the head. Dummy, it's this. This is what you need to look at. Uh, that That's very helpful, uh, too. But when it comes to the the uh, doing it right and the productivity of doing it right, I mean, um, we did a, a joint venture with Turner, Turner Construction, and I was fortunate enough to be on the mechanical side still. I wasn't with uh, W.M. Blanchard at the time, but we did a central utility plan for Blanchard Turner for a, a, one of the local hospitals around here. And um, that project, I would say, was, would be, was built with 3,200 packages and not a single piece of paper, barely a tape measure, never a chalk line never a plumb bob it was built entire construction technology-esque we'll say 
And although the speed might not have seen as crazy because of people's expectations, having been a part of it, I know that without doing it that way, we'd probably still be building that building and, wow. and or correcting what was built in that building. That yes. was a that was a that was a real use case uh, that was great. Unfortunately, Revista wasn't wasn't with us at that time, which would have made it a lot easier. Um, but now, what I see is um, so we have a very stringent, and I brought up BIM implementation uh, plans or BIM protocols, right? Uh, I brought that up in my keynote because we do see a lot of, um, and uh, it's funny because. We go to these conferences and we all know that the people at the conferences are, are educated, but primarily the people at the con for conferences are technical people and they may have never actually worked for some of these larger, some of these other contractors or contractors. Well, I have, and I've signed your BIM implementation programs or plans only to see the job start. And my God, what happened to the BIM implementation program? Where did this all go? Because we're doing this like it's, 1999 it, it, yes. it's the same thing all the stuff that you talked about and the requirements and the must do's and the things like that are all gone by the wayside and it's all um well we have to put the walls up and we have to build this and we and and okay well your your bim implementation program and bim did not align with your construction schedule or your manpower didn't align with your construction schedule or the plumber that you hired doesn't have anybody that can detail you can't do this halfway you have to do this the entire way so we have a very stringent bim implementation program and when i say stringent it's not filled with all data mumbo jumbo technical jargon it's it hasn't been written by a by the best pen lawyer in the state of new jersey it's written by sal because it's real experience and what we have to do and it basically just tells you what you need to do to do the project right and that includes a competent detailer, a competent drafts person that has some type of experience or enough experience that I would say you could be the foreman. Because if you can't be the foreman, why would you be detailing all of the layout to give to the foreman? It yes. just doesn't make any sense at all. So if you're not going to have that person that is competent enough, you have to have somebody monitor it that is competent enough. And when we get that work to the field, we hope to have it be uh, constructible because let's face it, it's 2024. And if you are carrying a 21 foot or 20 foot length of pipe up three stories, bringing it through a window, bending it around corridors of an existing building, so you could cut it the same damn length that I knew it was when it was in the parking lot, you're a fool. Yes. That's just the way it is. And yeah. you see that all the time, Jason, you could go from job to job and see that same pile of 20 foot long lengths of copper on the fourth story of a building that you knew probably took a day to get up there. So the person could take it out and remeasure it to the same length that we knew it was when it was at the supply house. Yes. Right. That's just foolish. There's nothing, there's nothing else you can't, like, I will debate anything with anyone when it comes to construction technology. And I tend to be pretty good at it because I lived in your shoes, right? I once had a foreman tell me, I showed up on the job, okay? And um, he was a grizzled veteran, not a very, you know, proponent of construction technology. You know, he wanted to do it his way, proud of what he did. I understood that. But I showed up on a Friday and maybe he was already on his way to the bar and who knows, well, you know, the weekend was coming. He was in a good mood. And I showed up and I said, you know, how's it going here? We had just sent him out basically an entire mechanical room of fabrication. And his first reply was, oh, it's great. Sal, this went in over there and this went over there. It was great. And then he turned around and he looked at me and he saw my face. Then he remembered who he was talking to. And like a switch, it changed. And he was like, well, you know, Sal, what the problem is, you know, we got a data vault where the computer is over there. And I got a crew over there and I got a crew over there and I got a crew over there and I got one data ball. And I said, well, if this was a welding job and you had a crew over there, a crew over there, a crew over there and one torch, who would be the fool? You. Yeah. You're the guy that has one data ball. No one said you can't have another data ball. So what I'm getting at is you can't pull a wall over my eyes when it comes to those things in the field. I've been there. I understand that. 
So I have a lot of respect for them when it comes to that. I do not have any respect or any leash for anyone that is not cutting the pipe the, the length that it says it is and bringing it up through a building. That is just mind boggling. I mean, keep in mind, we're already saying you're doing your hangar layout or your support layout with the total station. So that's already done. So if the hangars are already there, the pipe lengths have already been established. Your center that's lines amazing. are already established. They already have to work. Okay. And for some reason, we have this mentality in the piping world that you can create a steel building three quarters the way across the country, ship that steel building three quarters the way across the country, erect it, bring another piece of steel into it with two holes that have about a 16th of an inch of gap between that pin and slide that pin in there and build that building perfectly with that prefabricated steel. But to cut a piece of two inch no hub pipe and put it on a job pre-sized, that's impossible. <laughs> Think about that. Think about that. Let that I, I, I just across love everyone's heads. No logic in that. It doesn't make any sense. Doesn't make any sense to anybody that way unless they truly just want to believe something. Because that is just not the fact. You can absolutely do that. And I lean that more towards the pipe trades because let's say if we held our sheet metal contractor to the same standard. Let's say we have a third floor of our building and your sheet metal contractor shows up with a roll. A thousand pound roll of metal, a brake, a cutter, and puts it on your floor. Every general contractor, not only in the state of New Jersey, but the entire universe would kick that sheet metal contractor off the job immediately. But for some reason, as a piping contractor, you could show up with six inch carbon steel and 20 foot lengths, throw them on a vise, set up welding screens, and put a fabrication shop right in the middle of my third floor hospital so you can cut the pipe and weld the pipe the same size that I knew it was when it was in the parking lot. And I'm not supposed to have a problem with that. That's beyond insanity. That is the definition of insanity. You knew yes. exactly what that was. You decided to bring it all the way over here and put it together directly under the piece of uh, the hangers that you were putting it in. That's just, there's no room. There's no place for that in my opinion anymore. There's just yeah. not. And I know it sounds very harsh. It was harsh in 2005. It was harsh in 2006. Maybe 2010, it was like, all right, be a little bit easier on them. In 2012, 2015, it was like, hey, you know, maybe you guys should start getting it. It's 2024, right? Yes. It's 2024. Yes. Like I told in my keynote speech about that project manager, right, who's hovering over that piece of paper and highlighting with a scale rule. And you really need to just ask him if he's having problems at home. That's why he's working late, because there's no reason for him to be in there highlighting a set of drawings that no longer have anything to do with the building, right? Yeah. Those are all things that I saw my first model in, in 1999. It's 25 years ago, okay? You mean to tell me in 25 years and, and people that are in the same industry as me and have been at a higher level of the industry than I was 25 years ago. They were higher than me 25 years ago and still can't open a model and operate a model. And they are praised by their organizations. Those same project managers, same superintendents, we'll throw them all into the same bunch. Those same ones that say and have said to me, oh, Sal, I'm very busy. I don't have much time to learn how to use the model. Ask them on a Wednesday afternoon, or sorry, a Wednesday morning at about eight o'clock, if they want to go golfing because a vendor has a has a opening and a tea time at eight o'clock at some really nice country club. Watch how fast their clubs are, are, are being rattled around the back of their car looking for their golf shoes. They yeah. they so they they all of a sudden have four and a half five hours to go play golf, but they don't have a half hour to learn how to use the model. That, now, as a principal of an organization, you have to see that. You yeah. have to understand that and you have to say, listen guys, you have to be able to collaborate with the entire team, you know? And the same thing goes, I mentioned our, our designers, 
The same thing goes for them. You, you can't create a model, have issues in the model, hand us a piece of paper and think that's where it ends. When we have questions, why would we ask those questions on the piece of paper when there's a model? We have to ask those questions on the model for your clarity and for our clarity. And you should be in that model with us, helping us, assisting us with what we're doing. And if you're not, then it's just going to take longer. And we have one goal, to make your design constructible. We're not, there to hurt you. We're not there to tell you what you did wrong. We're there to work as a team. So rather than me sending you a soliloquy of an RFI to try and explain the thousand ways that I tried to fix what you designed incorrectly, how about I just send you a Revisto issue so you could look right there at it and correct what is, in, in essence, your problem, right? Yeah. I mean, it's not my problem. It's not like it's not like I'm saying, listen, I know you ran six-inch pipe over here. I'd rather run one-inch pipe, right? That's a silly question. It's you have a four-and-a-half-inch pipe and a three-and-a-half-inch wall, okay? Yeah. I shouldn't have to go to a Procore RFI and say, at this, at the east wall of room this, at four foot high, the, the, the hub of the fitting penetrates the wall. I shouldn't have to do that. What I should just say is, here, look at this. You look at it, you open it, you say, I'll, I'll increase that to a six inch thumb. Yeah. Done. Yeah. That's what should be happening, right? That's not there. Now, where's the debate, right? We should, what we need to do, Jason, is have this podcast invite everybody on and say, we'll debate that. Hey, I, that's I, a I went to, brilliant idea. Let's let's do right? that. Let's let's have a podcast where we have a panel discussion. I'll, yeah. I'll bring some friends along with you yeah. and we have that debate. Yeah, you're an engineer. We're trying to help you. And you don't want the help, in essence. You don't want to join us. So what's the reason? Now, if the reason is, well, you don't have Revisto. I do. I, you're getting it from me. You, you, you don't need it. Okay, I'm giving it to you. Well, you don't know how to use it. Well, you better learn. It takes you about a half hour to learn how to move around the model. You're already a designer. You're already a detailer. It's not like you've never opened up a computer, right? So you have some type of idea. Just join us. Just help us uh, along the way, you know, because when you don't do that, you're just going to prolong it and make it worse. Then we start getting ag aggravated, and then we want to start saying, well, we have all of these issues. We have all of these issues, you know. Uh, we did a project recently where the engineer uh, uh, accommodated that, and you know, we we answered probably 75 RFIs without them ever becoming an RFI. You know, just, you know, th this the carrier doesn't fit in the wall chase. The pipe doesn't fit in the wall chase. Okay, approved wall size change, you know, and we just kept moving on and rolling through it. You know, you could push those issues to, to your traditional Procore for record afterwards, but the idea is to keep moving and get those answers in there, you know, and get everybody involved. And we should be getting those people involved at the design phase. We shouldn't be waiting to get those trades people, that trades person and their skill set involved. I mean, this is factual. It's not a sal opinion. This this happens. We have engineers who are technical, and again, all the credit in the world to them. They start from scratch and they build a design intent that, and we couldn't do it without their vision. We couldn't. Couldn't do it without. But it gets from them, and then we push it to our coordination team or our VDC team that we've gone over at length, but them not being knowledgeable enough, right? Our project managers don't want to have anything to do with being in the model, so they're not monitoring it. So it's seen an engineer who's never installed pipe fittings or anything like that. It's gone to a detailer who hasn't done it. And now when that group says it's signed off and done, we now give it for the first time to the people that are more passionate and more knowledgeable about installing it than anyone else that has seen it yet and where you are at the installation phase. Yeah. That person that's more knowledgeable, more passionate about what they have to install needs to be looking at that during the design phase, not during the installation phase. It's too late at that point. Now you're talking rework. And everything that we go against and the reason why we do the whole virtual design process is to avoid all of that rework, right? If you 
take any person, I would assume if they go to Ikea and they saw a desk already installed, okay, already put together, looked at that desk and then took that same desk home, it would be easier for them to build it because they've already seen what it looks like physically installed. We are giving everybody that opportunity to do it. The only thing is because of field pushback, because of our history and the way we push the field away from it, because of our project managers and them not being involved with it, the first time those people are seeing it is when they open up that regular paper sheet of IKEA things. And what they're doing is they're putting the draw, the draw face upside down. Yeah. They're forgetting to put the screws in the back of the draw. They're forgetting to do those things because it's still the first time they've seen it. The person who is more knowledgeable about what those people are installing is the person that's sitting in the seat, but they're not installing it. That, that person needs to be involved with that process throughout the, throughout the process from the design phase right up to the time that they in install it and then watch how more productive they would be if they had all of that information for them already. It would be yeah. light years ahead of where we are now. So one one final thought. Um, this has been an amazing podcast, and I'm mindful that we we must do that uh, panel debate. Um, but I, I reckon we could have you back on for a, a second podcast and continue this conversation. It's been so engaging and passionate, which is infectious. But I, I need to get your final thoughts on one thing before we wrap up for today's podcast. And we, you talked about AI and um, how in the future, um, maybe AI will have 30 years of construction experience and be able to assist. But the, do you think this vision will meet reality because we've talked a lot today about how it's already been 25 years and the reality is not much has changed. Um, you're doing an amazing job. Um, some of your counterparts and peers around the world are following in your footsteps and taking that leadership role, but the industry is vast and enormous. Do you, do you think we are making a difference? Yeah, I do. I mean, I know I talk hard about the industry and, and um, you know, all of the things we do wrong. There's, there is a lot of good. You know, um, I, I have a tendency to overlook that because there are so many things that are obvious, to, obviously bad to me, but there are a lot of good. You know, like I said, you know, we you show up on one of our jobs, the total station is being used and, you know, people are cutting pipe and, and fabricating and bringing things out to the field. And it's and it's definitely Revisto has improved our ability to coordinate 100 to 1 because with the old software like well, i like to refer to as collaboration call it duty instead of call a duty yeah, it's yeah. called it duty that one it, it it was so cumbersome to try and get issues resolved with you know sending screenshots and doing everything and it, the fact that it wasn't live and all of that stuff that it took so long that eventually what happened was you started to get to a point that you were you had to build it and, you know, once you start to build stuff while you're still coordinating it, it's like, all right, well, you're moving, you know, a, a bunch of pipe and fittings around. It's already installed. So now when it gets out there to the field, it can't be moved because it's already installed. So you're kind of just wasting the rest of your time doing that coordination process. And we saw so much of that in the past. And I could say since since the adaption of Revista, we don't see that anymore. That is gone. That's fantastic. You know? Um, with our project managers being more involved now with Revisto because it is collaboration, Call of Duty, right? Uh, Call of Duty. It, it's it's so much easier that they understand the process now, right? I mean, in years past, the project manager would, manager would be sitting around waiting for people to go work, and he would be like, "What's going on?" Now they're engaged, they're involved with it. So when things are taking long. They completely understand why it's taking long. They're involved in the process. They get yeah. it. In the past, they, they were blind to it. And the only thing they wanted to see was people in the field working. So now when things are a little bit slower, you get a little bit more, a longer leash and a little bit more time because it's understanding of what we're doing and what we're trying to accomplish. So um, yes, it's made a tremendous difference. It really, it really has. But to say it's made the difference that it should make, not even close. Not even close until I, I said on, on another another podcast recently, until we get to a point that we are not making it an option, we have not succeeded. And until that point, and so we leave it as an option, 
there is always going to be someone who comes in with that lower number that you just cannot avoid, right? I mean, let's face it. This business relies on money and and very low margins, right? And if you're bidding to a mechanical contractor and one mechanical contractor gives you a number of 5.5 million and the other one gives you a number of 4.5 million, you can't justify leaving a million dollars on the table. So you're forced to go with that contractor, but that's because you left it as an option, right? Because if that same contractor, let's just say the entire job was a welded carbon steel job. If that contractor showed up and said, here's your low number, but by the way, I don't weld, you'd kick them right out the building. Yeah. But when he shows up and he's a million dollars lower and he's lower and he says, but I don't really do any of this VDC stuff. We're still at that point where we're like, all right, well, we can, we'll try our best. We'll do whatever we can. <laughs> That's what we do, right? Yeah. Until we get to a point that we say, you're not eligible. The same way the guy that doesn't weld, the same way the guy that doesn't use man lifts, he wants to use ladders. He wants to bring 20 foot ladders on my floor because he doesn't have anybody that knows how to operate a man lift. That yeah. would never fly either, right? Until we eliminate that option and let everybody bid apples to apples, same type of organizations bidding the job will never win because. It's it's like it's this it's the same, and I don't want to put the union non-union world into it, but it's the same as bidding a union project and a non-union project and, and comparing the prices and comparing it's not the same quality, it's not the same labor numbers, it's not the same labor factors, it's it's not it's apples and oranges. We're doing the same thing on the virtual design side when we let contractors that aren't capable of completing the virtual design bid the project. And and not putting the same emphasis on it. And that goes back to those project managers that are buying it out and getting them more familiar inside the model, inside the Revisto model and understanding it. Because once they do, then they will finally start to put the same emphasis on the virtual design phase as they do on the construction phase. Because let's face it, the day we fall behind in construction is the day that that project manager rips into that email and says, I need more workforce here tomorrow, where you have to be working on level two and level three and level four simultaneously. You need six more people. You need to work Saturdays on your dime. That's what's said. Fall behind on the virtual design process? What can we do, Sal? They're just not good at it. What, what can we do? Because they don't have the same emphasis on it. It yeah. has to be the same emphasis on it. If you're not if you're not competing with the schedule on the virtual design size, you need to be able to increase your workload or your time the same as you do in the field. Why is there any difference? There shouldn't be any difference. It's the foundation sure. of what we're doing out there. So that that we need to grow that emphasis on it, and Revisto helps in that way. Um, fabulous final thoughts and uh, Sal, an absolute pleasure to have you on the podcast uh, today. Looking forward to the next one. Uh, really excited about getting a panel debate going on on the podcast with you featuring in it. Again, thank you for doing your keynote at RevUp. Absolutely inspiring and keep up the amazing work going forwards. Um, we will change this industry together um, and we will build better together. Excellent. Thanks so much, Jason. Thank you. Thank you.